uh, going to be a discussion about uh, many of the major things that are happening uh, this year and going into the next few years in the industrial base, and our sense is that there's potentially uh, quite a bit of activity yet to come, uh, and quite a firestorm of debate set off this fall by the decision uh, of uh, Lockheed to acquire uh, Sikorsky, among other transactions of note that have happened in the last six months, and the Department's uh, recent comments about that. Um, and, and we certainly want to get into that. We also are taking the opportunity this event to present some of the findings of a couple of reports that CSIS has completed over the last year. Uh, we did these uh, pursuant to uh, BAA by the mm -hmm. Naval Postgraduate School, so I want to thank them for their support uh, for these projects uh, and also thank the, the many staff at CSIS and uh, between these two studies there's almost too many to mention, but uh, Greg Sanders to my right, our, our research director, and Jesse Ellman who's going to be presenting uh, our findings were uh, really uh, the, the main engines behind these, these two reports. And so uh, before we get too deeply into it, let me give our obligatory security announcement. If anything were to occur, which it won't, but if it were, I'll, I'll give you guidance about what to do. We'll either leave the way you came in or, or leave out the back, depending on circumstances. Uh, and uh, let me just briefly say, uh, and I think for this audience it doesn't need uh, too much uh, reminding, but that the industrial base is an absolutely critical component of national security for the United States. As uh, my old boss, uh, Dr. Carter, was fond of saying, the Department of Defense makes almost nothing that it uses uh, in war. Uh, it acquires uh, almost all of it from, uh, from industry, and therefore industry is a key partner in national security. And so the question of what's happening in the industrial base, what is the health of the industrial base, uh, and, uh, and, and how can the department most effectively partner with the industrial base uh, is a really critical one to national security. Well, without any further uh, ado from me, let me uh, introduce Jesse to come up and uh, walk you through our two reports, uh, one on competition uh, in defense contracting and one on products. Uh, I'll just briefly say that uh, we did these reports. Competition, we think, is a critical way of measuring the health of the industrial base. Um, certainly, in many cases, uh, we don't have the opportunity to have uh, kind of traditional robust competition. Uh, but when it is there, or when it's uh, growing or declining, we think it is an indicator of industrial base health. Uh, and then secondly, our study on products uh, basically opens the scope uh, on most of the studies that you'll see on defense acquisition, number one, by going beyond major defense acquisition programs to the full scope of products that DOD buys and looking at trends in that, in that arena. And then secondly, by a lot of pioneering work that, that Jesse did to bring in data sources that go back to 1990, uh, which is traditionally uh, uh, the federal procurement data system uh, data doesn't go back that far. And so it was a real innovation to bring in these additional data sources. So, Jesse, please. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jesse Elman. I'm a research associate here at the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at CSIS. And I was the lead author of the two studies we're rolling out today. Uh, we're going to be presenting a few slides today, not going through everything in our two reports, but highlighting a few pieces of data and some analysis from the report that we think kind of sets up the discussion we're going to have today with our panel, talking about the state of the industrial base and what may be coming in the years to, years to come. Uh, for those of you watching online, our slides should be available on the website. I'll try to give the slide numbers as I go through so you can follow along. Uh, I'm going to start with our, with our study on defense pro the defense products industrial base and the defense products contract trends. And our, as Andrew said, the main innovation of this study was getting data back to 1990. This data is technically available through PDS, but not really in a usable form. And we put in a lot of work to gra grab this data back to 1990, because what we really wanted to do was look at the last drawdown, the post-Cold War peace dividend drawdown, and, the impact, and, the, and kind of compare that to what's going down during the current drawdown, to see if we can kind of glean any lessons learned and kind of compare and contrast. And what we really saw is, there's nothing really comparable going on now that, can, that looks like what you saw, it, the effects of the kind of post Last Supper industry consolidation that happened during the 1990s. And this chart really illustrates that. This chart shows defense contract obligations 
for, for defense products only. For this chart, we're looking at only products broken down by the size of the vendor that receives the obligations. And here we're talking only about prime vendors. FPDS focuses only on prime vendors. There's another database that deals with subcontracts that we hope to do some work with in the future, but at the moment we're dealing only with prime vendors. And we break it down into four size categories. Small vendors goes by the government classification. We make a couple of adjustments. Our numbers for small businesses are usually about two to four percentage points below DOD numbers. Large, we could define large vendor as any vendor that has more than $3 billion in annual revenue from all sources, not just government. Medium, if you're not small and you're not large, we classify you as medium. And then we have the big six vendors, which are the six largest defense vendors. In this case, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General, Dy General Dynamics, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and United Technologies. you see in the composition of the defense products industrial base as a result of the last supper industry consolidation. If you look at the black line near the bottom, that line, that's McDonnell Douglas. In 1996, McDonnell Douglas alone accounted for 15% of the defense products industrial base. Once they were purchased by, by Boeing, once they, or they merged with Boeing, you see that purple line, which is the big six, shoot up. The big six includes Boeing. But it's not just McDonnell Douglas that accounts for the consolidation of the industrial base into the big six. You see the red line, which is medium. In the, in the mid-1990s, medium vendors accounted for as much as about 25 to 30 percent of defense products co contract obligations. But you can see that number go down significantly and has hovered about 15 to 20 percent ever since the kind of early, late 1990s, early 2000s. What we think is happening there is a lot of these media, a lot of these medium vendors either left left the defense market, sold off their defense businesses, or were absorbed wholesale by the lar largest vendors. And you can see going into the 2000s, and particularly in recent years, you don't see anything quite like that level of upheaval. Small and re medium, the blue and red lines near the bottom, have been relatively consistent. There's been some fluctuation between large, and, at large, the green line, and big six, the purple line, but that's primarily the result of wartime spending. You had a lot of spending, particularly by the Army, for things like MRAPs, going to large vendors who weren't part of the big six, and that accounts for the big rise in spending for large. And in recent years, as wartime spending has fallen off, you see the big six starting to recover market share. This is also a factor that during the drawdown, the largest, the largest contracts for kind of the largest high profile programs have been relatively preserved, and those mostly go to the big six. This next slide, though, really shows you the level of stability in the industrial base, even during the current drawdown. This here, we're looking at overall DOD contract obligations, not just products, products, services, and R&D, broken down by si the size of the vendor they're going to. And you can see relative stability all throughout the 2000 to 2014 period. Small, relatively stable, a bit of a jump in 2014. Medium has dropped off a little since the early 2000s, but has been relatively stable at just over 20 percent ever, you know, all throughout, the, all throughout the recent period. Large and big six, some year-to-year -year fluctuation, but again, relative stability. And what this tells us is, even during this period of drawdown, there hasn't been a significant change with a lot of, vendor, a lot of vendors leaving the market and a great degree of, consol great degree of consolidation. And you can see this particularly if you go, and we're on slide five now. This is looking specifically at the industrial base for aircraft-related pr products. So aircraft, and primarily in aircraft parts. And what you can see in the 1990s, a large degree of upheaval, which is primarily the result of McDonnell Douglas being acquired by Boeing. McDonnell Douglas at one point was 50 percent of, of all, air, all contract obligations spent by DOD on aircraft products. But what you can see is throughout the 2000s, relative, relative stability, a, little, a small degree of increase in the share of obligations going to large vendors as opposed to the big six, but on the whole, great deal of stability. But this isn't true in all sectors of the defense industrial base. Now, uh, we're on slide six now, looking at electronics and communications products, again, broken down by the size of the vendor. And you can see, again, in the 1990s, a great deal of people. At one point, medium vendors actually accounted for the largest share of contract obligations for electronics and communications, dropped off significantly after the Last Supper, as, a lot, again, a lot of those companies were either bought up or got out of the, 
defense business and the big six surge. The really interesting trend though, if you look in the 2000s, the blue line, which is small, in 2014, small businesses accounted for the largest share of electronics and communications contract obligations. We have 16, we break down defense contracts into 16 categories of product services and R&D. This is the only category where small business has ever held the largest share of obligations. And, at 20, and they're at 28% in 2014. That is the largest share that small business has held in any category in any year that we have in our, in our database. And what this really tells you is a lot of these electronic consumer communications, small firms, are the kinds of small innovative firms that DOD has really been trying to get in, get in the industrial base and keep in the industrial base. And this, the rise you see in recent years isn't necessarily the result of a big increase in obligations going to small. What's actually happening is, as overall electronics and communications obligations have dropped by a third since 2008, Obligations going to small vendors have basically been stable. So in a really tough market for electronics and communications products, those, these small, innov potentially innovative vendors that DOD is really trying to get in the market, they've been able to keep them in the market and th those small vendors have been able to maintain their market share in a really difficult market as large and big six overall have dropped 45% over this period. So now we're gonna move on to sort of the competition report. And one of the really, we've, you know, this, we're on slide seven now for those following at, following at home. And one of the things we've been, you know, the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group has been tracking trends in defense competition for a number of years now. And one of the things we found over the years is that despite the heavy focus within DOD and within the government overall on promoting competition, getting more, comp, getting more competition, the needle really hasn't moved to any great to a great degree. If you look at this chart, this chart breaks down the rate of effective competition, and here we're talking about co co contracts put out for competition that receive at least two offers, which we think is kind of a baseline if you're talking about getting effective competition. Broken down by component here, Army, Navy, Air Force. Uh, you know, if you see, look at the black dotted line. That's the rate of competition for overall DoD contracts. All, all across DOD, DOD-wide. That includes DLA and other, and other aspects like MDA, uh, Missile Defense Agency and TRICARE that aren't, shown, that aren't shown separately on this chart. But you see, that number has been pretty consistent all through the 2020-2014 period, hovering right around 50%. And even in the last six years, despite the heavy focus on promoting competition, that number has basically been unchanged, hovering right around 50%. There's been a little fluctuation in Army, Navy, Air Force, but not to any great degree, and a lot of that is kind of due to changes in what they're buying. For the Navy and Air Force, a lot of that has to do with what years they're buy buying F-35s and what years they're not buying F-35s. But the, the big trend here is large-scale stability. And to a degree, given the sharp decrease in defense contract ob obligations over the last several years, the fact that they're still getting the same level of competition, despite you know, a, dropping amount, a, a falling amount of contract obligations, is something of a victory, but they're, not seeing, they're not, still not seeing the improvements that they'd like to see. And you can really see the stability in our next chart, which looks at, again, rates of effective competition for, D, for DOD contracts, broken down by what DOD is pro buying, products, services, and R&D. And again, you can see, Ex, you know, a really high level of stability. Again, that black dotted line is overall DOD, right around 50%. The green line on top is services. For the last several years, the rate of competition for defense services has been hovering right around two thirds, virtually unchanged. The blue line at the bottom, defense products, hovering right about 33, 35%, relatively unchanged. R&D, the red line, again, relatively unchanged. Just a great deal of stability in rates of effective competition even looking at different categories of what DOD is buying. But one of the things we've seen in our analysis of defense contract trends going back several years is if you dive a little deeper into the data, you can find some really interesting trends. Now, we're go going over to slide nine here. This slide looks at the rate of effective competition, specifically for defense services, services only, broken down by component, Army, Navy, Air Force. Here, the dotted black line is the rate of our competition for services DOD-wide. Again, about two-thirds all throughout the 2008 to 2014 period. Army, relatively stable, a little bit higher. Navy, the dark blue line, relatively stable, a little below, hovering a little above 60%. But the Air Force, 
If you look in 2008, the Air Force was at 56 percent, already about 10 percentage points below the rate for DOD overall. But that rate has plummeted in recent years to 41 percent in 2014, 25 percentage points below the rate for DOD overall. Uh, our group has recently re released a report about two or three weeks ago looking into this. I won't, you know, I won't go into a great deal of detail on it. It's available on our website if you're interested. But the really interesting thing here is that most, you know, a you know, most of this drop appears to be a real decline. A portion of it is due to a portion of it is due to data reclassification and some shifts in what the specific types of products the Air Force or services the Air Force is buying. But most of this decline appears to be a real decline. And this is a big surprise to us because the Air Force has really taken a leading role in improving services acquisition tradecraft. And we really didn't expect to see this. And we're not exactly sure why this is happening. The data give, doesn't give us full visibility into you know, why this is happening. But we think you know, policy, this is something that should come to the attention of policymakers because this may be an opportunity to find more, find more competition in defense contracting. And really, our defense, you know, the defense competition report that we're rolling out today, the, cr the real crux of the analysis is the idea that if you really want to understand what's going on in defense competition, you have to dig down deeper into the data and to, to really see what's going down at kind of a, you know, a micro level rather than macro level. So what we did in this report, we, for, we, took, we, took, we looked at the contracting portfolios within particular states and within particular major contracting commands. And we generated a model to say, based on the types of contracts they're using and the mix of, co uh, the mix of what they're buying, we generated a prediction of what their rate of competition should be and then compared that to what their actual rate of competition was. Now, the real benefit to this was it caused us to look within the portfolios of these states and, M and within these major contracting commands, MCCs for short. And when we did that, we found a lot of really interesting trends and potential opportunities for finding more competition. So on this first slide, we'll, this is slide 10. If we look at NAVAIR, Naval Air Systems Command, $24.8 billion in contract obligations in 2014. Our model was pretty close on predicting their level of competition. We predicted 15%. The actual rate in 2014 was 17%. But if you look within what they're buying, you can find some, re you can find some interesting trends. For example, for overall DOD, 21% of contract obligations for aircraft and drones, and this, include, this categorization includes all product services and R&D related to aircraft and drones. 21% for DOD overall are awarded after effective competition. For NAVAIR, only 14%. For electronics and communications, again, product services and R&D related, 45% for DOD overall are awarded after effective competition. Within NAVAIR, only 29%. Then if you go kind of below the kind of, you know, platform level to Naval S Supply Systems Command, NAVSUP, to look at a uh, major command that does prim primarily supply and support. 2014, NAVSUP has $7.1 billion in contracts. We estimated a 52% rate of effective competition. Their actual rate of effective competition was only 33%. Why? Again, for aircraft and drones, 21% effective competition rate, DOD overall. In NAVSUP, 3%. Electronics and communications, 45% rate of competition DOD overall. NAVSUP, 23%. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that NAVAIR and NAVSUP are necessarily doing anything wrong. There could be perfectly legitimate reasons based on the specific things that they're buying where they can't get any more competition you know, than they're actually getting. But for policymakers, this sort of analysis can say, well, they're getting less competition than maybe expected. We can look, at, maybe we should look at, into that because this could be an opportunity to maybe find some opportunities to get more competition than we're getting. To may maybe there's an opportunity to improve acquisition tradecraft. But, you know, we also, look, we also looked into the contra contracting within states. And the purpose there was slightly different. We were hoping to find states where there were weaknesses either in the overall industrial base or in the industrial base for certain sectors. And what, you know, here we're looking at Virginia. So there are $33.6 billion in contracts performed in Virginia in 2014. Our model, again, was relatively accurate in predicting the rate of effective competition. But when we looked into what was going on in the contracts performed in Virginia, we set, found something very interesting. For R&D contracts performed in Virginia, 36% of those contract obligations were awarded after competitions that got only one offer. This is over double the rate for R&D nationwide. 
And this was really surprising to us because you think about Virginia, the contract performance in Virginia, the sheer density of vendors in this area that are theoretically capable of competing and capable of performing contracts. It was really surprising to us that over a third of R&D contract obligations performed in Virginia were awarded, they were put out for competition, but they only got one, but they only got one bid. And again, we, we think the, this sort of analysis here is, an is sort of an opportunity to find areas where maybe you can find more competition. Because if you look at the trends overall, everything seems stable. But if you dive down a little deeper, you, f you find some interesting trends that, may that might represent opportunities to find a little more competition in the, de in the defense market. And now we'll turn it back over to Andrew and our illustrious panel. Well, thanks, Jesse. And, and just one additional point there, uh, where you find cases of competition not happening where you thought it might be happening, again, it may be an indication that there's either an existing or a growing uh, issue in the industrial base that needs to be examined more closely. Well, let me introduce our fine panel and get this, uh, this discussion started with, uh, with uh, now that you've had your spinach uh, <laughs> of, of slides and data, uh, we'll get into uh, our discussion. Uh, we have with us today, uh, am I right, Greg Sanders, who is, uh, again, head of research for the Defense Industrial Initiatives Program uh, and, and uh, really the guiding light for these two studies. Uh, he's going to join us for the Q&A portion of the panel. Uh, to his right is Marjorie Sensor, uh, a, a, a journalist, uh, works at Inside Defense as the defense business editor, uh, previously uh, worked for the Washington Post and its uh, capital business publication, uh, and before that at Inside the Army, Politico. She's, she's done it all, actually. Um, and so we're excited to have her with us. She focuses very much on these industrial base issues uh, and has been a great source of information, for, certainly for me, on these matters. Uh, to her right is Tom Davis, uh, who is uh, currently serving as a chair at the Defense uh, Acquisition University, uh, the industry chair. Uh, he has uh, had a distinguished career in industry, uh, including uh, a, a, a range of companies, some of which maybe he'll mention, some of which maybe he won't. Uh, and also, he is a senior fellow in residence at the National Defense Industry Association. Uh, and to his right, Todd Harrison, my colleague here at CSIS, uh, a longtime expert on defense budgets, uh, but also someone who worked in industry uh, and, and particularly in the, in the space area where uh, there have been some interesting developments in the industrial base in the last few years. So uh, why don't I start by turning to Marjorie and uh, please give us a few of your thoughts on what you see happening out there. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here to talk about this interesting issue. Um, I think that you know what we're seeing from the CSIS reports is is what we're seeing out in the market that we're not necessarily having the the 1990s happening again. Um, so far, it's not resulting in fewer vendors. I mean, I consider this a little bit more of a rearranging than a consolidation. In fact, in some cases, you're seeing um, you know more vendors instead of fewer. Things like the SAIC split or um, spinoffs are creating actually maybe more competitors in, in certain spaces. Um, but I think that this rearranging, um, it might just be where we're headed. It also can sort of set the stage. You know, if you break things up into pieces, they're a little bit easier to buy or to bring together um, in different ways. So if you, an, an example I think is Excellus, which itself was spun off from ITT, divested what's now Vectris, and then was merged into Harris. I mean, in, in short four years, it sort of came full circle. Um, so uh, I think, though, it's fair to say at this point it's not the 1990s. It is something different. Um, but I don't think that that means the lessons of the 90s are, are irrelevant. That was sort of a, um, a question I looked into for a story um, about two years ago. I started asking some of the, the players in the 90s, what are the lessons? What are the, the things that um, are relevant from the 1990s as we're looking at what's happening right now? And um, what really stuck with me was a conversation I had uh, with Norm Augustine, who was the CEO of Martin Marietta and later Lockheed Martin after that very significant um, move. And what he said was uh, when he was at Martin Marietta, um, they, they knew something was going to happen. They felt something was going to happen. And so they started making uh, a binder of all the companies that were in the market and might be up for sale. And, and would we want to buy them? What's the business portfolio here? So um, when, when those companies did come up for sale, they, he said they could say almost you know, 
instantly, do we want to purchase you or not? Um, and so I think that's what I'm hearing over and over again from executives is that preparation is really what you want um, in this scenario. And of course, having a, a good amount of cash on hand can't hurt um, either. Uh, but I think that's, you know, that's what I've heard from even Agility today, which has been one of the, the early movers, is they had their eye on task very early. They thought this is a business that will merge well with ours. So you're hearing some executives say, move first. If you move first, then you get what you want. And if you kind of hunker down and wait, then you're kind of left with, with what's there. So I think that's what I would say are sort of the lessons from um, the 90s, that even though this isn't necessarily the same scenario, uh, might, might be relevant today. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, Tom. Well, uh, first of all, I may applaud uh, Andrew and his team for all the work that they've done. This is a data-rich and a data-convoluted uh, uh, topic. Uh, I recall going in to see the Army chief back when I was on the Army staff in the 90s during the last drawdown with some data that I thought was quite compelling on an issue we had on the table about how quickly and how deeply to take the Army in strength down. And he obviously wasn't biting on the recommendation that I had, and I finally played my trump card, which was uh, sort of the data here is pretty compelling, at which point uh, he leaned back and responded, uh, you know, Tom, data can serve two purposes like a lamppost. It can either eliminate or support a drunk. But uh, in this case, I think it's uh, illuminated uh, quite a bit. So I'll, I'll give uh, Greg and his uh, team high marks on that. I went to a uh, uh, presentation about two weeks ago at another one of the uh, noted uh, public policy think tanks around town, and the topic on the table was about modernization and what do we do about it and how do we control it and where do we go from here and what's acquisition reform look like. And uh, as a testimony to how complicated and how difficult this whole topic is, um, none of the people on the panelists, uh, despite the best efforts of the moderator to get them to talk about it, uh, r really would. Uh, they'd make a, well, like uh, political figures almost, they'd make a brief comment, yeah, that's an important thing, but here's what I really want to talk about, and then we go on to something else. I, I guess uh, I just want to make a couple of, of points uh, quickly. Let, let's try to, I'll try to restrict it to three. Uh, one, the drawdown we're in right now is fundamentally different from the one we did before. Marjorie said people, uh, I think she basically said people are always looking for relevant lessons from what happened before to what's happening now. and. Sometimes the relevance is quite high, sometimes it's uh, a bit low, but in this case it's quite clearly different. Uh, the drawdown we did in the 1990s was uh, one that was driven by a single fact. Uh, the threat had changed, the Soviet Union had collapsed, the Cold War was over, we had a new political priority that was expressed in the country with the election of Bill Clinton in 1992. And within uh, the Pentagon, where I was at the time, there was a clear understanding that priorities were going to change and the defense top line and therefore defense programs were going to come down. And they did come down rather significantly. If you look at the procurement accounts from uh, 1990 to 1998, as I recall, where they bottomed out, uh, procurement went down 60%. Uh, but we thought we could handle that back in those days, and the major reason we felt we could handle it was we had a relatively young, uh, new capital stock. Uh, the Navy had three of its aircraft carriers that were five years old, uh, the later Nimitz class. The Army had just fielded the big five. Uh, somehow or another, the Army has never figured out that they ought to go back to some sort of big five concept since then because they've been fielding the big zero ever since. Uh, in the Air Force, uh, the uh, F-15E was a relatively new airplane, and none of this had been particularly stressed. So uh, we had a new capital stock. It wasn't particularly used. We felt we could cut procurement back and take a bit of a holiday. And of course, Dr. Perry called in the major defense companies and essentially delivered this message and set off what was uh, the consolidations that we saw in the 1990s, where somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 major players turned in into five. Uh, or six, depending on how you want to talk about it. And uh, since Andrew mentioned it, uh, af after I uh, left the government, I uh, wound up serving in, in two of them, Northrop Grumman uh, during the period of the uh, late part of the 1990s and the early part of the last decade, and then uh, General Dynamics uh, after that. I think one of the reasons you're seeing uh, the stability uh, that uh, Jesse indicated on a lot of his slides is that the major consolidation, the major muscle, muscle movements have basically happened. Uh, they happened uh, back in uh, that particular period, that consolidation happened. Uh, 
and now you are seeing a lot of stability, which uh, basically has been the case at the top tier uh, since 1998 when uh, I was with Northrop Grumman and uh, the famous Northrop Grumman Lockheed Martin non-merger uh, occurred after a year of work and a lot of HSR people from Justice digging through my office. Uh, I was amazed at one point they took out more papers than I thought I actually had in my files. Uh, and that uh, came to uh, a halt when the government announced it was going to oppose uh, that particular merger, and that basically stopped things at the top. Uh, could that start again? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, reports are that uh, people at senior levels in DOD are a little bit unhappy with uh, the Sikorsky uh, spinoff going to Lockheed Martin because they're concerned about it. Um, let me just uh, end uh, with a couple comments from uh, the perspective of what we've been looking at at NDIA, and um, we're going to make another effort to try to get a, a big handle. Others have tried this before, uh, good friends of mine fast, on what the defense industrial base you know, really is right now, and I think the work that uh, Andrew's team has done is very instructive and very helpful in this. Uh, but a couple of things that I think we, we need to keep our eyes on. Uh, in 1980, when uh, President Reagan was elected and uh, initiated the, what we now call the Reagan buildup, uh, at that moment in time there were 14 companies, major companies in this country, that made high-performance military aircraft. Uh, currently we have, by my count, essentially two and a half, uh, with a half being Northrop Grumman, and we'll see if uh, they're still in the business after the Long Range Strife Award uh, or not. So we may go uh, to two. But that's a significant drop of industrial capability. Uh, shipyards, uh, we've gone down to four that are publicly owned. They only do repair and overhaul. And we've got, uh, I think, five now that are privately held, uh, which are the ones that actually build the equipment. Again, a significant drop from what we saw in days gone by. I took a look at the Fortune 500 that was released by Fortune magazine uh, in June, went back and took a look at the data from uh, that particular listing, which is a nationally recognized database. Uh, certainly much less uh, intense in data than what uh, Greg and Jesse have been dealing with. But if you take a look at that and go back to 1961 and take a look at the moment when President Eisenhower gave his speech about the military industrial complex, uh, what you can see is at that moment in time there were 18 companies that were either wholly or uh, in a very large way in the defense industrial base, and they accounted for 30 percent of the annual revenue of the top 100 companies, 18 of them in the top 100. Today you have four in the top 100, the top two being Boeing and United Technologies. Boeing is two-thirds commercial aircraft. United Technologies, with the sale of Sikorsky, is basically exiting the business. So you're going to find probably when the thing comes out next year that there's going to be uh, two. Uh, my old hometown, General Dynamics, holds the number 100 position. So my suspicion is with revenues being what they are, they'll probably drop down to 105 and so, or some level and get out of that. So in other words, we're, we're seeing uh, a consolidation uh, and in some cases uh, an exit from uh, the business that I think we're going to have to uh, wrap our heads around at some point in time. I wanted to inter uh, add just a couple of comments I had on two slides in particular. Uh, actually, uh, I'll make it four. Two of them show the same thing. Uh, charts number three and five about the uh, product uh, differentiation and where it's all gone. I think if you look at those, you can see that the top tier companies uh, really have become quite dominant when it comes to making major products that basically only they can make. I think Wes Bush was in this building himself about two months ago and made that very point, that you've got a lot of people out there that can make components, that can make pieces, but there's really only a handful of people at this point, per my earlier comment, that can make the upper tier military capable items that uh, will never be produced in the commercial sector. I had a discussion with Nick Jabri at GD one time. Actually, I didn't. I just had me sitting at the table. and. Somebody raised the question about how come we don't have advertisements about General Dynamics going around the loop at uh, the Verizon Center when the Wizards are playing because somebody had been down there and they saw that Northrop Grumman does. Northrop Grumman's always been more aggressive about advertising than GD. And uh, Nick kind of looked at him and he said, uh, do you think there's somebody in the audience who plans to buy a submarine? Uh, end of discussion uh, on that. But you can see the, the dominance that's uh, going on there. Uh, chart number six on communications and electronics. Uh, during my time at GD, the communication and electronics business unit went from basically nothing to the biggest unit in GD, 11 billion, through acquisitions. There are a lot of small players out there. Uh, 
that can be brought together and kludged together, and I think that you can see, uh, see that in the chart with uh, where you're looking at with the medium and small companies. And uh, last thing, just an observation on my point for you, Greg, uh, having uh, had battles with this in the Pentagon in days gone by with the United States Air Force on percentages of the top line distribution, uh, I would suspect that that drop on chart nine about the USA uh, Air Force services going down the way it is probably uh, reflects uh, the intensity that the Air Force has in the, in the uh, intelligence world. And once you get into the intelligence world as a provider, as an, a vendor, there's a great reluctance on anybody's part to switch or compete or go to somebody else. You're comfortable with who you have. You don't want to go through the process of getting through all the security clearances and getting to know people and get comfortable with them. So uh, those would be uh, uh, my comments, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Tom. Tom. All right. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I think this is a really excellent uh, report. Uh, and, and I actually want to refer back to one of the slides as well, if we could go to, to slide three. Uh, and this is actually true, the trend we see in several of these charts. Um, you know, we're in a budget drawdown right now. Uh, we're entering our fifth year of the budget drawdown, although, knock on wood, we don't know what the FY16 appropriations is going to be yet. Uh, DOD certainly requested uh, an increase, so we may see a turnaround. Who knows? Um, but, you know, the, it's, it obviously brings comparisons to the previous draw, budget drawdown, which actually a lot of people forget that the drawdown uh, actually started before the end of the Cold War. Uh, the budget peaked last time in fiscal year 85, peaked this year uh, in FY10, uh, this drawdown. Uh, and so peaked in FY85, started declining in FY86, uh, and then the decline actually uh, started to bottom out in the late 90s, and as Tom mentioned, it, it hit the absolute bottom in FY98. What's interesting to me is that a lot of the consolidation you see in terms of the contract dollars uh, going more and more to the big six primes, uh, that didn't happen until about a decade after the drawdown began. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at this drawdown and what might happen. Well, if it was going to be like the last drawdown, uh, we may not start to see it for another few years. Now, I also agree with Tom that this time is not like the last time. The situation is fundamentally different. Um, certainly, the threat environment, the strategic environment is very different because we don't see the world getting safer, getting more organized, getting uh, you know, more favorable for the United States. We see it getting less so uh, all around the world in many different ways. Um, but, you know, uh, we, we could very well see uh, some additional changes in the defense industrial base this go around. I suspect, now I'm just guessing at the future here, uh, but I suspect that we may see the defense industrial base change its shape more at the second and third tier level of contractors rather than at the prime level. Um, and here I'm talking about the companies uh, that make the components and the subsystems that go into uh, the big platforms that DOD buys. And here, I think it's interesting that there's the potential for hidden monopolies. And I say hidden monopolies because DOD does not always have good insight uh, into who is making all of the different components and subsystems that go into these uh, major platforms. Uh, and what you could end up with is that the big six primes could all be going to the same second or third tier company for a very specialized component, like a, a specialized computer processor uh, or a specialized type of battery. Um, if you've got all the primes going to the same uh, subcontractor vendor uh, for those components, they may not know that they're all doing that, uh, and DOD may not even necessarily be aware, unless they're looking for it, uh, that the department is uh, you know, solely reliant on one company for certain types of components and subsystems down at the second or third tier. Now, I know uh, AT&L has made uh, a lot of progress in trying to map the defense industrial base down at that lower level, but that is a really difficult task. Uh, so I think that that, I, I would be looking at the second and third tier level to see where there might be some opportunities for consolidation and even ending up with uh, a single vendor situation for certain types of components. We may also see companies just exit the defense business. Uh, we've seen some of that before. Uh, there may be more of that to come. Uh, and they may not exit entirely. Uh, a company may just decide to get out of a certain sector uh, of the defense business. Uh, 
Uh, and what that would mean uh, is that we could have some uh, monopolies or duopolies in additional sectors of the industrial base where currently we have more healthy competition. Um, and so that will have long-term impacts in terms of reducing the opportunities for competition in the future. Now, on the flip side, we may also see some new entrants. We, uh, and certainly DOD is encouraging this and hoping for this, uh, to see some new companies, uh, commercial businesses, startups, uh, get into uh, the defense market. You know, we're seeing companies like SpaceX uh, trying to break their way into the space launch market. But as the SpaceX, as SpaceX example shows, that there are some significant barriers to entry uh, to get into the defense market. Uh, and some companies may try and fail, and other companies may look and say, you know what, it's not worth it. We'd rather stay on the commercial side. Um, so the, the result here, I think, is in the coming years, uh, regardless of how this all shakes out, the Department of Defense is going to have to change the way uh, it approaches management of the defense industrial base. In many sectors, uh, management has been more laissez-faire. We'll just see what happens. Uh, I think more often, though, uh, more sectors of the defense industrial base are going to require more active management. I think the Navy actually does a good job of this in managing work at shipyards uh, because they know they have a very limited number of shipyards uh, and they have to appropriately manage uh, their production plans um, and be conscious of the workloads at different shipyards so that they don't lose uh, another vital asset of their industrial base. So I think more and more sectors of the defense industrial base are going to have to be managed uh, that way by DOD. Um, uh, now, it's especially important uh, given that we've got a bow wave of modernization plans coming in the future years. Uh, you know, if you look out at the long-term projections in the 2020s, uh, we are currently planning uh, to be buying quite a lot of equipment. And a lot of that is because, uh, as Tom pointed out, in the Reagan buildup in the 1980s, we did procure a lot of equipment, a lot of new systems, especially for the Army, uh, but we bought a lot of ships for the Navy as well, a lot of planes for the Air Force. We are still operating a lot of that equipment, uh, and it will need to be replaced. And we have put off the replacements uh, for many of these systems about as long as we can. Uh, and so we're going to face a choice in the 2020s of either we recapitalize, we replace that legacy equipment from the 1980s, in some cases earlier, uh, or we just do without. Uh, and if we're going to replace it, uh, that means some major modernization programs will have to take place nearly simultaneously. I mean, if you look at the current plans right now, I'll just pick on the Air Force, uh, but this is true for the other services as well. Uh, the Air Force is ramping up to full rate production on the F-35. Uh, they're about to award a bomber contract, hopefully, any day now, uh, and that will be ramping up to full rate production in the mid-2020s. We're ramping up to full rate production on the tanker, the KC-46, uh, and also the Air Force plans to start a trainer replacement program Right? Uh, not to mention the Air Force One replacement uh, for presidential airlift, not to mention uh, JSTAR's recapitalization. Uh, just, you know, you look at all of the modernization programs for Air Force aircraft that are stacked up right now, uh, and it's immense. Uh, and so that alone, even if the money is available, which is not clear that it will be, but even if the money is available to do it, that will really stress the capacity uh, of our defense industrial base, especially in this post-consolidation uh, era. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that given all of the challenges facing uh, the defense industrial base now and the budgetary uncertainty that we're facing, uh, that it's really incumbent uh, on leaders in the Defense Department uh, to get more actively involved in understanding the defense industrial base uh, and uh, being prepared to actively manage it where they need to in certain sectors. Thank you. Well, thanks, Todd. And I had to chuckle when you talked about uh, the, the primes potentially all clustering around a handful of suppliers and not even being aware that they're all using the same suppliers. I see we have in the audience Brett Lambert, who led the department's S2T2 sector by sector, tier by tier, and that was exactly what they found in many instances, was that there, was a, that there were single points of failure uh, in the industrial base of which, uh, which were not obvious uh, prior to, to under gauging in that effort. And of course, that was an amazing uh, effort, an amazing task that they took on, but that, that data does age uh, because industrial base changes. And uh, 
uh, we're going to have to make sure that, that those kinds of issues continue to be looked at. Uh, I promised myself I was going to go immediately to the audience, but I, I just have to follow up. Uh, there were some really rich threads that were raised, and in particular, um, uh, it, a couple of things were mentioned about the importance of the lower tiers, the second and the third tier, uh, and also about the possibility that through market exits you could end up with duopolies or monopolies happening not because people are merging but just because someone got out of the business and left only one competitor. And of course, uh, uh, the 800-pound the elephant in the room today is the comments that Frank Kendall made uh, a week or two ago, uh, maybe it's now been three weeks. Uh, about his frustration with, uh, with the antitrust review process and his sense that it doesn't provide the tools for the, the more, uh, more active management of the industrial base that Todd has indicated is probably needed. Uh, and that, of course, set off a firestorm, and I understand why. And, and this is probably a good time to mention that, I, as I understood his comments, they weren't specifically suggesting that the Lockheed Martin-Sikorsky deal was itself problematic, but that going through that process kind of revealed for him some of these issues that uh, the antitrust process doesn't, doesn't necessarily, isn't the tool uh, that lets you manage the industrial base in, in, the, in the way that, that he might like to. Um, so uh, it raises the issue of, so what is the department's policy really for managing the industrial base? Uh, I think there's certainly a desire to do so, uh, maybe a lack of tools, but uh, Marjorie, I want to put you a spot a little bit because I know you've been tracking uh, this debate that's been out there between uh, a, a variety of actors. And so I just wonder, do you feel like there has been articulated a clear policy uh, approach to either lower tiers of the industrial base or, uh, or the possibility that, uh, that there needs to be other tools uh, and what those tools might be for managing the industrial base? Um, I think everyone sort of felt like they understood the policy that was articulated in, I, I guess, 20, 2010, 2011, when um, Dr. Dr. Carter said, we're okay with consolidation, but not at these the very highest levels. And um, frankly, I think uh, Frank Kendall's comments um, have thrown the industry into a little bit of confusion about what is the policy. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that Lockheed thought that it was potentially violating this policy by buying Sikorsky, which isn't necessarily part of um, what we think of as the big five or the big six. So I think um, in some ways it's kind of created an opportunity for, for industry to ask, well, what is the policy after all? Um, you know, there have been some sort of spots where the policy seems more articulated. Um, the Army did a significant combat vehicle study and looked at some of those lower level suppliers um, and, and maybe there were some con conclusions there that helped um, fill it out for um, the companies involved in that in that market, but I, I yeah I think part of the turmoil after Frank Kendall's comments have been, well we thought we sort of had a policy, but maybe that's not a policy, and and sort of where are we now? I re I really think it has raised um, the question of I think industry would would like a more clear policy at this point, um, or or um, would like to feel like they understand what are the the levers. You know if there's no legal basis to oppose it, what might the Pentagon want to do in that scenario? I would add one thing is that, you know, maybe in some cases the department could stop a merger or acquisition, but I don't think they can stop a company from exiting, right? And so that's, that's a, a real risk where they don't have any levers at all to pull um, that they've got to be concerned about. I do think, um, Andrea, that you, that you made the right point that um, I think uh, the Frank Kennel seemed to be saying that I'm, I sort of realized that I, when I looked at this case that I don't have a lot of levers that I can pull, and, and maybe this isn't necessarily the scenario where I would want to, but, you know, I should be prepared for um, a scenario that, that DOD would want to um, oppose or, or change in some fashion. Okay, well, I, I took my one stab because I couldn't resist, but let me now open to the audience. Uh, we have a, a really a great group here, uh, and if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Someone will, will bring a mic around. and. Uh, Tom Dickinson with uh, TechCast Global. Um, are there any product or service areas today where there is only one vendor that leaves the services no choice but to go sole source? You know, the kind of a critical red light alarm bells going off situation. Well, chip building, there's only one place you can buy an aircraft carrier. I'm aware of. <laughs> and I mean, and I think um, naval nuclear reactors too, right? Yeah. 
submarine design. You know, well, yeah, uh, submarine design is one where it's uh, it's very narrow. I think you're going to find, uh, at least at the upper product end level, that uh, the places where you've uh, got the narrowest range of choices, and sometimes the choices that you have are actually generated by the government, uh, are going to be in the in the in the shipbuilding domain. Uh, I think uh, if the market was left to itself, you would probably only have one provider of, of submarines out there. The, the Virginia class arrangement was uh, something that was driven more by political expediency than by program efficiency. And uh, I think the current CEO of GD has signaled pretty strongly that for the Ohio replacement, she is not interested in having an, another teaming arrangement. What, uh, uh, we'll certainly see how that goes. I think, uh, by, by and large, a discussion I was having with Greg before we came out here, that um, if you look at the competitive data uh, and the trend lines that are shown on the briefing, uh, uh, Greg says he's, he's got uh, data that, that shows it that's not part of his briefing yet. I think that's a follow-on study that he plans on doing. But, you know, um, the, the definition down the footnotes on the, the report is effective competition is two or more competitors. What you can't see from the trend lines that were shown today is, you know, does that mean in most of those things you've got a competition with two people or, or with 20 people? Uh, my suspicion is you're probably uh, in the, the current decade, and you know, Todd and I were talking about what, what's the current decade. Let's say the, the the last 15 years. Let's, let's stretch the decade <laughs> phrase just a little bit. Uh, as uh, as I think most of the trends indicate, you've got a degree of stability, so uh, you, you probably are, are pretty stable there. However, going to my comment about uh, if you go back into the 1990s or even the 1980s, you're going to find there are a lot more competitors out there for high-end products, particularly in, in aircraft and ships and, and other things. Could I add one more thing that? There are also effective monopolies that may not be an absolute monopoly. Um, you know, if you take fighter aircraft, for example, we are necking down to one production line. You know, once the F-18 goes out of production, uh, it will be the F-35. Now, are there, will there still be companies that could potentially build a fighter? Sure, but the reality is that there's a big barrier to entry for DOD to get another fighter program going. They would have to pay for, you know, a new start development program. And, I mean, the same will be true with the bomber, that, you know, uh, we're only going to be able to afford one LRSB, uh, one model, I should say. More than one, hopefully more than one plane. Um, <laughs> You never know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, w once that's awarded, then, you know, there, there are no other options to buy bombers. It's we either keep buying that one or you wait and start a new program, which is going to be prohibitively expensive. So, you know, you still end up uh, with many of these uh, contract awards with an effective monopoly for the foreseeable future. Uh, so, first a small plug, um, our Defense Contracting Trains Reports gets into the details of multiple offers, and we do have one probably coming out in the next few months uh, that will include uh, that level of discussion in terms of, you know, is it two, is it three or four vendors, is it five plus? But we've heard a little bit about this. Competition is ultimately an input, uh, and you have a variety of outputs, things like, you know, quality, which is the hardest for us to get to. Um, you know, were there cancellations or terminations? Were there overruns? We have an upcoming report that gets into that some. And sometimes the tie between competition and the outputs of concerns aren't necessarily, you know, as strong or as clear-cut as you'd think. There's a lot of theoretical literature about how the defense market is unusual there, um, and new entrants, commercial, is one way to get around that. But are there any other thoughts from panel about where competition is most beneficial, you know, and where non-competition is most pernicious, you know, that we want to make sure to translate from competition to focusing on specific monopoly areas or the like. I think we've heard from new entrants, we've heard from second and third tier, and we've heard about exit, so that's a starting point. Uh, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at that one for you. Um, I, I think the data shows, and I think our discussion right here kind of indicated that right now when it comes to what we traditionally look at as the upper end military items, uh, ships, bombers that Todd was just talking about, I think increasingly probably the uh, unmanned aircraft. Um, in those, uh, they get to be specialized things that you can probably get by with uh, one or maybe in some cases one provider, 
Uh, however, I would also suggest that uh, the uh, oversight that the department provides that one provider probably ought to be a uh, rather traditional essay. Uh, you can probably get by. Uh, Norm Augustine once made the comment that uh, I want, uh, as a, he was speaking about his time as the Under Secretary of the Army, I'm okay with uh, two providers. Uh, I'd prefer five, but I can get by with two as long as they're healthy companies. Because when you start getting unhealthy companies bidding, desperate companies do desperate things, I think was uh, the comedy made. So you, you want to have competition that's actually real competition, and you don't want to uh, have underbidding. Um, I think the place that's interesting right now, and it shows up in your communications and electronics uh, chart out there, is so many of the systems that we have, and I mentioned the three aircraft carriers that were five years old in, in 1990. Well, you know, those, uh, those things are 30 years old now. You will get them upgraded through uh, electronics and inserts and so forth. Those are widely available. Uh, throughout the uh, economy. If you go on board one of the submarines, and I don't think I'm putting out anything that's uh, unusual here, but uh, you know the days of the captain looking through the periscope and uh, turning around and you hear the ping in the background that Hollywood likes to have, you know, those are really kind of gone. Everybody stands there and looks at a, a Dell monitor, which uh, has a fiber optic that goes up there, so it's not just the captain, but it's pretty much anyone that can, can see that. Uh, that, of course, is a, a largely a commercial uh, item. The uh, last point I want to make on this, and it goes back to what Marjorie said about uh, the spinoffs and, you know, agility and, and so forth, is uh, I think you're going to see a motivation for a lot of companies to spin off parts to smaller parts and uh, to become suppliers and sub-suppliers and so forth. And frankly, uh, it's because you, you can make more money there. Uh, margins are better as a supplier because, uh, as was mentioned, you know, we don't have a real Grip, grab on who they are, and their contract is with the prime. So there was a report just the other day that uh, you know a, a supplier is going to make more money than a, than a prime. And one thing I think the department has to really come to grips with, which which is a change. Uh, the major companies these days, as I like to tell people, are run by the descendants of Jack Welsh, not Jack Northrop. Uh, when Ike uh, made his comment in 1961 about the military industrial complex. The companies that were in the top 100 uh, of the defense business uh, were operating at a loss. Uh, well, they're not going to operate at a loss anymore. These companies today are run by the descendants of Jack Welch. They're into shareholder value. They're into margins. They're into you know, getting uh, earnings and stabilizing them and so forth. And they'll be quick to get out of an industry and get out of something that's, uh, that's not making money. They're not going to operate at a loss uh, anymore. And when they see an opportunity to put something out there where somebody else can do better and make money. And if you look at the press announcements, at least, that's the United Technology commentary on getting rid of Sikorsky. Sikorsky is a 7 percent business. Otis and Carrier are 15 to 20. Uh, so we're going to return it to shareholders in terms of buybacks and dividends, and we're going to focus on the higher margin businesses and see if we can find some more. So this is a new trend that I, I don't think the department has quite caught up with yet. I just wanted to add, add to that in terms of the, the question. You know, what's interesting about the shipbuilding industrial base where we find certainly the most cases where you have uh, only one company you can go to is it's completely divorced from its commercial counterpart. Uh, and, and that happened, you know, a couple decades ago. Uh, and you can't lean on the commercial industry as a backstop or as a notional future competitor, as, as Todd mentioned. In aircraft, we, we're necking down, but the theory goes that uh, in, in terms of both the aircraft and potentially the engine, that there are other people in the commercial space who could enter that market at a later date if they chose, if you can keep some, some design capability around, they have the production capability. And, and that's an interesting study. I mean, the question is, that's been true in aviation for a long time. Will it still be true? Will it continue to be true? You know, will the Boeing, will Boeing, I was going to say the Boeings of the world, but there's not that many of them anymore. So will Boeing, if, if Boeing is not, you know, winds up without uh, a contract for a combat aircraft uh, in the next 10 years, will they ever be interested in re-entering that market? Uh, and I think it's a very, I don't have an answer to that question. I don't, I don't know that anyone has an answer to that question. Uh, it, it's, you know, we have, there's going to be issues in aviation that we may have already seen in shipbuilding that we haven't seen previously. And so uh, it really gets to this question of can the department continue to be, to access 
commercial industry, because that's really a linchpin of the industrial policy, but I think it's not made explicit often enough. And when you get divorced from that commercial market, uh, then you're in the world that the Navy has been in with shipbuilding for two decades. And they've managed it. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's not a disaster. Uh, but it certainly has had uh, pretty important uh, uh, implications. Can, can I also address Greg's question a bit? Um, you know, back to you know, when does competition really make the most sense and when do you get the most benefits from it? I did a study a few years ago and uh, constructed a game theory model of how contractors would be incentivized to bid uh, under different uh, forms of competition. Uh, and what I found, and you know, it shouldn't be too surprising, is that you're going to get the best cost benefit in terms of contractors being incentivized to bid lower and lower uh, when it's uh, an acquisition where you're buying a relatively large number of systems and the upfront development costs are relatively low. Uh, and so when you're talking about the major platforms that DOD buys, they often don't meet those criteria because we aren't buying them in large numbers. Uh, and the upfront development costs are quite high because it is a unique development for the Department of Defense. Uh, and so in some of those cases, the cost benefits of competition just don't make that much sense. Now, there are other benefits to competition other than just saving money, things like innovation, uh, reliability improvements, and sustainability of the platforms. Um, but that you only get those benefits of competition when it's a healthy competition, when you've got you know, more than one healthy company competing. If companies are operating on razor thin margins uh, or negative margins, just trying desperately to stay in the business, uh, then they aren't gonna have the money to invest in innovation and sustainability and reliability. They're just gonna be very narrowly short term focused. Uh, and in fact, they may be hoping to make back the money uh, in the long term by the platform maybe not being all that reliable. Uh, so you have to come back for uh, more uh, business in the future for upgrades and replacements and spare parts. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's why DOD's really got to, uh, you know, think strategically about when it really wants to apply competition and when you need to just, you know, admit that there's not enough of a market here for competition. Uh, and shift the way you manage the industrial base uh, and manage it more like a public utility uh, in those cases. Let's go to another question from the audience. Here. Two quick questions. Um, I'll let you kind of divvy them out. Um, what is the role of foreign military sales in this narrative of drawdown? And is it a lever? How is it being used? The second is, what is the real impact of LPTA, lowest price technically, technically acceptable, on competition? And how real is it? Is it a lot of talk? Is it a lot of griping? Is it changing the trend? Is it a trend? And what are the changes in acquisition policy? Very brief one in part two. Uh, in terms of documenting data, it is incredibly hard, and we have not been successful. Um, we have tried to look at it from a variety of ways to the degree that LPTA is actually specifically mentioned in a solicitation. It's a lot harder to see a real trend there, though when a lot of people are concerned primarily about LPTA, I say it's not whether the words lowest price technically acceptable in some combination are used, it's whether it's the decision criteria. And that's sort of decision criteria is unfortunately not available in the public data. I'd, I'd jump in on that uh, that LPTA um, point, which is that I, um, I I really can speak only anecdotally from what the companies are saying, but they were saying it's very bad, and now they're saying it's better. But I think I would agree with Greg that they're saying a lot of times it's not LPTA technically, but but price is is a huge factor. And I think that it's safe to say from the companies that I track in the services market in particular that price is a huge driver of the reshaping that's going on. I think a lot of companies are looking, um, even the primes are looking at the margins and services. And I mean, that is what Lockheed is saying is that if you are, if we spin off our services work, it can have a totally different overhead structure and those margins can can be better. And that's, um, that's the Angility case from L3 and L3 is now spinning off another services business because its margins were not, were not there. And so I think, um, whether it's LPTA or just to focus on price, I think that that's a, a major driver in um, services companies becoming pure play and, and prime contractors saying the, the price focus in this business, the margins in this business do just do not fit with, with what we're trying to do. I, I'd 
just uh, I, I did some consulting work for a couple of small companies that are in the services business, and uh, my own LPTA in my mind is a, a very uh, uh, contemporary way of saying least bitter. Uh, because that's what you're getting out there. And a lot of companies are, uh, the good news is, I think from the government's perspective, is uh, they're really bidding low. Uh, the bad news is, is that one company I was consulting with uh, had cut their rates on a program they were bidding for by 25 percent with no idea how they were going to actually recruit people to do the job. And uh, the customer said he would have a serious discussion with the uh, three lowest bidders, and they weren't one of the three. So I think at some point in time you're going to begin to get back to the issue that LPTA is driving you down to uh, a level where you're, you're going to have to seriously worry about the quality that, that you're getting, something that we get back from time to time when we uh, when we've gone through the, the least bitter things in days gone by. It's always a struggle between trying to balance uh, value with controlling cost, and I'm a little concerned where this was heading. Uh, in terms of FMS, uh, a lot of the companies are very uh, much uh, interested in trying to uh, expand into the uh, overseas market. Several of them are very aggressive about it. Uh, some of them are quite targeted because the reality is is that there's only a handful of places in the overseas market that you have much of a chance to land a big contract uh, and do quite uh, and do quite well with it. So I think there's going to be more emphasis on that. I did a I had a chart I showed uh, several leaders one point in time that companies in the commercial sector that are heavily in the overseas market and of course companies in the commercial sector don't have the barriers to get through that a defense company does. Uh, those companies have uh, higher margins and higher profitability than people who uh, are not. And if you looked at this chart, which plotted overseas sales against margin down here, the defense industry is in the lower left. Uh, people like Caterpillar and so forth are in the upper right. And you have to ask yourself, well, where do you want to be? Yeah, uh, just tag on the FMS piece that I think the data just came out on the exports. If I, I think I read about this, I'm a little riskier because I sort of read a blur, but that the U.S. increased its its share of the international market uh, in the latest data. So certainly the companies have emphasized it. They've set targets. They've met their targets by and large, at least the ones who've talked publicly about it. Uh, and and in fact, uh, again, the international data show that U.S. companies are competing very successfully in the national market, uh, which is good news. Um, but uh, I would also say that you know that international market is uh, the U.S. is still a huge share of the total global market in defense, and so there's no panacea there that can allow uh, us to not worry about all these dynamics that we've talked about with with the U.S. drawdown uh, that's taken place. And of course, as as Todd mentioned, you know, we may be in the favorable scenario that 2015 is the bottom year, depending on how 2016 uh, plays out, uh, and I'm certainly hoping for that, uh, but, uh, but, but we'll see. Uh, and, and where the budgets here are likely to go is, is probably going to have uh, a profound effect. In fact, as I've been, we've been having this conversation, and it struck me as I spent some time last night rereading Dr. Carter's uh, Cowan speech that Marjorie referred to from 2011 that said, essentially, we're entering a new era in defense industry. And we're entering a new era at the time, they thought, because we're going from budgets that were increasing at the high single digits per year annual rate to a budget that they expected at the time to be flat. And this was going to be a new era. Uh, well, what actually happened is he was, that was the second year of what we now know was a six-year drawdown. Uh, it wasn't flat, it was down, and it was down substantially, not quite at Cold War levels, but in percentage terms, pretty close. Uh, and yet, again, we haven't seen the kind of consolidation that we've seen before, and it seems like a lot has just been deferred. Uh, there must be change coming to some extent, it seems to me, uh, but people are waiting, and, and maybe uh, we're at a point now, we're one year away from a presidential election, uh, which may set uh, an entirely different path for defense. Uh, depending on the outcome, uh, and, and so maybe that's one reason to wait. I look at the in when I'm looking at the industrial base and some of the issues that we're facing right now, it seems that there, there's two factors that concern me. One involves intellectual property and DOD's attempt to try to uh, 
squirrel that which certainly could help long-term competition, but also is the secret, secret sauce that companies have. The second involves, uh, which I'm not sure what the current policy, but I'd like your thoughts of Mr. Kendall trying to control what companies spend their funds on in research and development from an organization that's not really done well lately on research and development itself. Uh, I'll take a little bit of a stab at that. Uh, uh, I, I, I would certainly uh, say that I am uh, pleased that there was some progress made on this IR&D question. Uh, uh, I think uh, we had an event that was also alluded to with Wes Bush back in May where this question came up and um, what, uh, what Wes expressed at the time is there is a, a pretty important role for dialogue between industry and the Department of Defense on where are the R&D investments that companies are making that are independent, um, but they're, uh, at the end of the day, of course, DOD is still the customer. So uh, it, 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 the decision making can and should be independent, uh, but it has to be informed by well, what does the department really need? What does the department really want? What can it really afford? And so uh, even though the I, R, and D, the I is independent, uh, it is not divorced from where the department's going and what the department wants. And so there's a need for dialogue. and and. Uh, the, the, the revised policy that was announced is a step in that direction. Uh, I think there's still questions about how do you implement that in a way that doesn't, um, that doesn't lead to a bureaucratic outcome, you know, because there's dialogue, there's real dialogue, and then there's paperwork that gets submitted because it meets a, a regulatory requirement to be submitted, but, you know, how is it ever really used? Does it really inform anything? That's, there's still that possibility of falling into that trap. Um, and I think that's a concern to be monitored. But by and large, I think they're moving towards a pretty good resolution of that issue that focuses on the dialogue piece and less on we need approval for X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I think that that approach did uh, very much lend itself to the kind of bureaucratic trap that I, that I would be concerned about. Uh, on intellectual property, I think you're right that that, uh, particularly when you're trying to remain tied to commercial industries that are vibrant, uh, especially in the IT space, uh, but also in aviation and engines and other areas, uh, that uh, being handling the intellectual property issues appropriately uh, is is a really key factor. And uh, I, I've been guilty in my past life and my past sins uh, during my time on the Hill of having mucked around a little bit in the statutory provisions that, that surround intellectual property. And I think uh, it's definitely time to revisit that because the basis of uh, of what passes for IP statute for DOD, uh, I think really doesn't, doesn't align very well with industry and with the world as we see it now. I uh, throw one little caveat in there on that, uh, Andrew. Actually, it's, a, it's a, a complimentary comment after uh, Secretary Carter went out to Silicon Valley back in April and gave his speech to the community out there at Stanford. Uh, we, we got an email from a member company at NDIA. It's owned by a woman. and. Uh, regarding the whole intellectual property issue, which of course is a very hot button ticket for them out there, being who they are and what they do, she sent a note back and she said of the secretary's uh, speech, interesting speech, an interesting proposal, but from a woman's perspective, I would tell you he doesn't have a rock big enough that anybody will put it on their finger. So uh, I think the, uh, there's a lot of concern that exists out there on, on getting through this because, you know, it's been, as we've all seen, DOD's practice over years to try to develop a thing. Uh, a company spends time, effort, and so forth developing it, and then after that's done and you've got the blessing and you get to the next milestone, then we're going to compete it uh, for production, which means, you know, the intellectual property goes to somebody else and there's always a suspicion about how that happens. So I think the, uh, Andrew's absolutely right. You know, there's got to be, uh, uh, some sort of rethinking about how we're going to apply the intellectual property preferences of DOD to the intellectual property concerns of the people out there who might be commercial providers. Uh, we had, we had one hand down here. I just would try and fit in one last question. I appreciate the audience's patience with us this morning. My name is John McGinnis from the Spectrum Group, and I was just curious if anyone on the panel could comment on uh, this morning's uh, discussion of the industrial base, primarily looking at a commercial side, but what about in areas where there's a government industrial base also, and then the natural tension between the commercial and then the government trying to keep and, I won't say prop up, but keep 
their organic uh, side flowing also. And it, as you look out into the future in terms of a drawdown, how that may play out. I think in the depots, um, that's clearly the case. Uh, that there is often the tension between, you know, does the government do the depot level maintenance in-house uh, or does it outsource that uh, to the defense companies? Uh, and Congress, of course, steps in here uh, and mandates rules uh, on what you have to do. And so in many ways, it's, you know, not always up to the department. Uh, on the, you know their sourcing decision of do they do it in house or do they go out house? Uh, Congress gets involved, uh, you know, for you know, parochial political reasons in many cases, um, but also thinking about you know we do need to maintain some cap maintain some capabilities in house uh, for strategic reasons. So uh, that that I think is going to be an ongoing debate. Um, yeah, and I would just say this is this is actually a, a really important issue, uh, one that we are uh, planning to address in a large way in the future. So stay tuned, uh, more more to come on that. And I think uh, we did address it to some extent last week with our performance-based logistics report, um, because I think the 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 tendency has been to cast this as a industry versus DoD organic, um, and what you see with happening in some cases through PBL, in some cases not cast as PBL, but I, to me, PBL kind of exemplifies it because it's focused on the outcome, uh, is that it's really about the government and industry teaming together. And there is no system that we support where industry is not involved. So it's never really a case of one versus the other. It's how do they interact? How do they support each other? And is that happening in the way that's the most logical, the most efficient, the most productive? Uh, and I think we have been a little bit frozen in that arena for some time uh, because we have uh, you know, A76 has been has been frozen, and uh, the, the the approach to the depot system has been pretty static for a lot of a lot of time. And when you see all of the drawdown that's happening in the force structure uh, and in the budget, uh, it seems logical that that uh, that's, that static approach is going to have to give way at some point to something that's more dynamic. And again, I think it's not, okay, now we need to go to outsourcing per se, it's how do we integrate these two things together in the most efficient way? And I think if we can have that conversation, uh, instead of getting tied up in a, in a battle about outsourcing, then I think that that's a productive way forward. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending and staying with us uh, for a long session. Really appreciate it, and please thank our panel uh, for an excellent discussion. And uh, reports will, are, will be or are up already on the website, uh, so take a look. And there's, uh, there's quite a bit more data there, as you might expect, uh, than what we were able to show you today. So please have a look. <laughs>